Welcome to the Victory Broadcast. If this ministry has impacted you in any way, please consider supporting the spread of the gospel by visiting us online and choosing the giving option that works best for you. Now we pray that this message will stir your heart and build your faith. Get ready to receive the word of God. Victory family, local and abroad, uh, grace and peace to all of you, the sons and daughters of the Father, the brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ, and to all of our friends who are tuning in from cities all around the country and even from nations around the world, we welcome you to uh, our virtual gathering. We welcome you to Victory Church, and we welcome you to week six of our teaching series through the New Testament letter of Philippians. Um, Now family, we are in the, uh, the last month of a very difficult year. Uh, A year that probably none of us right now will ever forget in our lifetime. A year that has brought a lot of tragedy and pain and loss, a lot of uncertainty, even death. A year that while some has flourished um, and thrived for the majority of us, it has been a year of just challenge. And I feel like more now than ever before, our hearts needs to be anchored in the word of God, in everything that he says, and in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. For if there's anything that 2020 has taught us, everything around us can be shaken. Everything around us will be shaken, but there is only one thing that will never be shaken, the kingdom of Almighty God. And there is only one firm foundation, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I feel like it is so fitting that we are walking out of this year, leaning into the scriptures, leaning into the person of Jesus Christ in a line-by-line exposition of one of the most powerful letters or documents preserved for us in the New Testament of the scriptures. What better way to close out uh, 2020 than with this slow walk through the letter of Philippians, being reminded of our Lord and reminded of the call that has not changed because of COVID, the call upon the church, the call upon us as a local congregation to be wholly involved in the work of Jesus Christ, the spreading of the gospel, especially in these final days of the church age. That call has not changed, and that call cannot be subjugated to someone else, for there's no one else coming to spread the gospel except the church of Jesus that's in the earth right now. Which makes these particular message I'm going to share with you today, extremely uh, important, valuable, um, probably some of the most important verses in the entire letter. And my prayer is that as we walk through this significant little section of verses, uh, something would come alive on the inside of you, apathy would fall off of you, complacency would fall off of you, and that we would all walk away from this time together with a deeper burden for what matters most right now and what's going to matter most a hundred years Uh, from now. Uh, We're going to be camped out in Philippians chapter 3 verses 1 through 9 and uh, I want to tag this body of the letter uh, 
with this title, uh, No Confidence in This. Uh, No Confidence in This. Eternal God and ever wise Father, we we thank you, Lord, that you are the only constant in this life. And though we are living through a very difficult time in world history and church history, Father God, I pray that there would be an awakening in the brothers and sisters, in the hearts of the men and women and teens who are listening to this message right now. I pray. That there would be an awakening in the church in this hour, in this time. Father, some way, somehow, I pray that you would call us back to the forefront of prayer, that we would be watchmen on the wall, that in pulpits all across America, the gospel would be heralded, the name of Jesus would be exalted, that sinners would be brought close to the cross. I pray, God, that on the backs of what matters most the preaching of the gospel the praying for the work of jesus that maybe our nation would see maybe just one more great awakening before we die one more great reckoning before we die god in a time where cotton candy gospels are flying around social media and all over virtual platforms when People are dying and being separated from you. If, if anybody should be awoke and woke and awaken, I pray it would be these, my brothers and sisters, as far as this message will go. I pray you would arrest our attention right now by the power of the Holy Spirit and that you would burn some deeper revelation into our heart. I pray this over your people in the mighty and majestic and the matchless name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the name that's above every name. Amen and amen and amen. Uh, No confidence in this. You know, family, in this year of 2020, we have mourned the loss of hundreds and thousands of lives that are no longer with us in the land of the living. And among all the names that are no longer with us in the year of 2020 in the land of the living, there is one name that rocked our country early. In 2020, it was the tragic loss of the NBA star, Kobe Bryant. Kobe despised the thick traffic in and around the city of L.A. And because of that, he had made a reputation of flying a personal helicopter around the Los Angeles area. Kobe had flown hundreds and hundreds of flights in his basketball career with no problem every time he hopped in that helicopter and hopped out that helicopter just going about his business making plans for the next day and the next week and even the next year he had plans for 2021 but on the morning of january 26 in this year of 2020 Kobe and a group of other passengers boarded that same helicopter for just a routine flight on what was a very cloudy and foggy morning on January 26. It was a day that the local Los Angeles authority had grounded all of their helicopter fleet because the fog was too thick to fly in that morning. And so all chapters belonging to the local municipalities, was grounded on that morning. But the pilot that flew Kobe around for many years, despite the warnings of the fog and despite 
the warnings of the weather in and around the Los Angeles area, he took off in that helicopter anyway. Never mind the warnings of the local authority, never mind the fact that all other helicopters have been grounded that morning. This pilot that was responsible for flying Kobe around for years, he disregarded those warnings. And despite everything that was told about the weather that day, he loaded up that chopper with Kobe and his daughter and other passengers and took off for what was supposed to be a routine flight. And as you and I all remember, it was on a Sunday morning. I was walking off the platform after preaching two gatherings that people came up to me from my team and said, did you hear of the news, Pastor? No, I, I, I haven't heard. I'm now walking off the stage. It was on that Sunday morning in January 26, walking off the stage at CSK. The news came to us that the helicopter that Kobe and his daughter and the other passengers was on had crashed in Calabasas just outside of Los Angeles. And at the hands of that helicopter was a pilot who was confident um, in his flying ability despite the warnings. The NTSB would rule out the helicopter crash as pilot error. The reason for the fatal crash was the error of the pilot. And what was the error of the pilot on January 26th? The error of that particular pilot that cost the lives of a number of men and women in the lives of Kobe and his daughter, the error of that pilot was an overconfidence in that which he could not save them from on that day. It was an overconfidence. And that which could not save that entire crew in that day. Let me, let me say that. What was the error of that pilot on January 26? It was an overconfidence and something that could not save that crew on that day. His flying acumen and the resume of his flying history. And because of his confidence in his flying acumen and his confidence in the resume of his flying history, he leaned into that confidence that could not save all those lives on that day. Our nation was aghast at the tragic death of Kobe Bryant and all those passengers that died that day. And in the same way, we, the people of God, should be equally aghast at similar tragedy that's happening all around us every calendar day of every single week of every single month of every single year the same way we was aghast at the death of Kobe and all those passengers we the people of God should be equally aghast at a similar tragedy that is happening all around us every single day every single week every single month every single year we should be aghast just the same way and there's Paul, the great apostle, in a preemptive teaching and warning, writes to the Philippian church and to you and I, a similar danger he writes about, about false confidence and something that renders us subject to dangerous eternal consequences. And we too should be just the same aghast at a similar tragedy that's happening all around us. And it's happening all around us because of false confidence that's going to leave men and women in a very dangerous place in eternity. Paul writes about the battles against joy coming from people and circumstances in Philippians chapter 1 and 2. And now he will turn to another thief of joy, a more nefarious enemy of joy, something that is rendering men and women in great danger every single day of every calendar week, of every calendar month, of every calendar year. He writes to them in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 1, he says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. 
It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. Watch these words. It is a safeguard for you. Now, the word finally here in this text does not mean that he's about to conclude the letter. But the word finally here speaks of a transition, a transition of thought from everything he taught in Philippians 1 and 2 to something more significant, more important. He was about to lean into in Philippians chapter 3 and Philippians chapter 4. It is a word that he used that was meant to trigger in them. Watch some measure of sensitivity that they will listen more carefully to what he was about to say that word finally was meant to trigger in them watch y'all need to lean in and you need to pay close attention to everything i'm about to share with you for the rest of this letter we are about to get into things that are very very serious finally i need you to pay close attention to what i'm about to share with you paul says and he says it is no issue for me to watch write this to you how much again that means although we don't have the first letter he may have sent to them in antiquity we don't know when he may maybe he preached this to them while he was with them in person is what i believe from my study but notice paul says that this thing is so important i need to tell you a second time This thing is so important, I need to remind you of what it is. This thing is so important, I need to make sure that you don't forget how significant this is. So it's no issue for me to tell you about this again. And then he goes on to say something very important. It is a safeguard for you. Two things we need to lean into in this first text. First, he says, rejoice in the Lord. Pay attention to the words in the text. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. Do this again and again and again. He says, rejoice in the Lord. That is, you be responsible for picking yourself up mentally, yourself up emotionally, yourself up spiritually, and doing what with the soul that belongs to you. Rejoice in the Lord. So he gives us direction for where we need to rejoice and a location for where we need to rejoice, not rejoice in the, uh, the house or rejoice in the bank account or rejoice in anything else. He gives us direction and location for where we need to rejoice. He said rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. It's an act of your will and my will. It is a personal decision we make that I can't stay in depression forever. And I can't be sad forever. And I can't stay in a dry place forever. But there is a heavenly father whose arms are open wide. And he says to watch, rejoice in the Lord. To find delight in the Lord. To remember joy in the Lord. This instruction is so profound and so powerful, brothers and sisters. Why? Because it's so easy for you and I to rejoice in other things. It's okay to rejoice in people and rejoice in relationships and rejoice in the new job and rejoice in the new opportunity it's okay to rejoice in those things but those things have one flaw when our joy terminates in them is that all those things are movable they come into our lives they can leave our lives but he tells us now to rejoice in the one thing that is immovable and the one thing that watch does not depend on the changing of my circumstance That is sometimes we only can rejoice or rejoice whenever circumstances is right. But if I can find my ability to rejoice in the Lord, the person who is always with me, the person who is immovable, the person who never leaves me or forsake me, the person that's with me on every mountaintop and every valley, that is watch, no matter what I am going through and no matter what you are going through, And no matter what state you find yourself in, there is a reservoir you can tap to find joy. And that reservoir has a name and his name is Jesus. And when I think about Jesus, I can find joy. And when I think about how he loved me, I can find joy. And when I think about how he's walking with me, I can find joy. When I think about how he rescued me, I can find joy. I could be strapped to a guard in a prison cell and find joy. I could have lost my job and found joy. I could be going through a difficult marriage and find joy. I could be dealing with the loss of a loved one 
had found joy. And so he gives them two powerful instructions. He says, rejoice in the Lord. This is good training for the hearts of believers. So we teach ourselves, watch, to tether the human heart to the one thing that is immovable. We tether our human heart to the person that's immovable. We tether our heart to find joy in the reservoir that is always available for us. And I have learned personally, I've been walking with Jesus for 17 years, family, and I've learned in my 17 years of walking with the Lord that the more we take comfort in the person of Jesus and the more we take delight in the person of Jesus, the more we keep delighting in him, watch, enjoying his presence, singing his praises, thinking about him in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, thinking about the day that we will be with him for all eternity. The more we keep finding delight in the person of Jesus Christ, the more it becomes natural for us to just be comforted by him. That sometimes I could be in the middle of a very dark and a very broken situation, and I don't need the circumstance around me to change. I just need to lean into the person that's always with me. And in the middle of anything, my heart can find joy. What a powerful instruction of the apostle to rejoice in the Lord. The second thing he says we need to lean into in this text is the repeated warning of a safeguard. (laughs) Paul warned them. He said, let me tell you this again of some apparent threat or danger that the Philippian church was facing. Obviously, they was in danger of something. There was something that was threatening the Philippian church, much deeper than just the division that was happening between those two influential women. They will be named in chapter four, but there was a more dangerous threat happening to the people at Philippi, a more dangerous threat happening to people in victory, a more dangerous threat happening all across the American church. And Paul said, I need to warn you about this again because it is often the, the, the ethic of good ministers to watch repeat themselves, especially when they're trying to teach people about something very important. Good teachers repeat themselves. And so Paul says, man, I need to tell you this again, and I might have to remind you about this again. Why? Because it is a safeguard for you. A safeguard from what is the question we should ask of the text. Paul said this, what I need to tell you again is a safeguard for you. And then the reader of the text should ask themselves the question, a safeguard from what? You know, about uh, maybe about uh, 12 or 15 years ago, I remember um, my wife and I were in Jamaica and we was out in Jamaica visiting some friends and uh, we traveled to Jamaica many times and When we go to Jamaica, we don't go as just tourists to kind of hang out like in Kingston and all the dope uh, hotels that's in Kingston. But when we go to Jamaica, now we go out into the countryside. We we go through small towns. We want to we want to kind of be immersed in the culture of the island. On this one particular trip, I remember my wife and I was in Jamaica and we was we was traveling in a car in the countryside, going up a mountain and down a mountain to go into the other side of Jamaica. And I remember we were sitting in the car. We was both uh, in the back seat, and we was traveling up this tiny, tiny road going up this mountain. And as we traveled up this road, I mean, this the elevation was so high. And I, I noticed as we traveled up this mountain road, there were no guardrails on the side of the road. And I'm thinking to myself, man, this road is so tight. There's trucks coming up and down this road, cars and trucks going up this road. The road is so narrow, so tight. The elevation was so high. And I'm looking around as an American like there's no guardrails on the side, no metal on both sides, no concrete on both sides. There's no protection on both sides of this road. And as we drove to the top of this mountain, I look out the window into these deep valleys on both sides. I don't even know how high it was. And all I see on both sides of this road are cars and trucks crashed up on the side of the road. Some of these cars were just laying just off the side of the road and they still had their color. So I knew that these cars maybe crashed not that long ago. But then as I look further down, there were other cars and trucks that were completely rusted over. And I knew that some of those cars, man, they had crashed a long time ago. 
And as I surveyed the road on both sides, I see some cars were watched. They were crashed, but maybe just close enough to maybe pull them out of those ditches. And then there were other cars, man, they were crashed all the way at the bottom of those valleys. I mean, they were in a place where they were never going to be resurrected from the bottom of those valleys. And I'm thinking to myself, man, man, there is, there is no, there is no protection on this road. There is no guardrails on this road. And my brothers and sisters, even as I think about that road that I traveled on Jamaica, that was, it was, it was so ominous and almost so scary, the elevation and the height and seeing all these cars crashed up, wondering who died in all these crashes. And I thought to myself, man, in a, in a similar way, all of us, you and I, we all are traveling down this road called life, this journey of life. All of us are on a road right now, a journey. And for the masses of us, those journeys embody travelers going down roads and up roads and down roads with no real guardrails on the side of their roads. Watch, no safeguards, no protection for this journey called life. They have no rail to the left or to the right except their conscience on one side and what little morality they have on the other side or maybe common sense on one side and what their mama taught them on the other side. But ultimately, in the absence of the wisdom of God and the word of God, anybody traveling through life without the wisdom of God and the word of God, they are essentially driving through narrow roads and dangerous convenes with no real guardrails to the left or to the right. Because ultimately, it is the word of God and the wisdom of God that create the guardrails for our life. It is the moral wisdom of God to my left. And it is, watch, it is the word of God and the theological truth of God to my right that forms the guardrails for people who are traveling in this life who are wise enough to lean into the scriptures, lean into the person of Jesus Christ. And that wherever these guardrails are ignored, the wisdom of God, the, watch, teachings of God, the moral truth of God, wherever these guardrails are ignored, then people are traveling down roads in danger, watch, of crashes that some of them will never recover from. Crashes of lives that will never recover from And When I think about the lack of guardrails, listen to me. How many people are suffering because of a bad marriage where there was no guardrails on that marriage? No husband submitted to the authority of Jesus Christ and some wife suffering because of no guardrails in that marriage. How many children today don't know some father, don't know some mother? How many broken adults are watching me right now because of some father that wasn't in your life or some mother that wasn't in your life, some man or woman that never had the guardrails of the wisdom of God and the theological truth of God. How many churches or people have been destroyed because of not having the guardrails of the word of God and the truth of God? How many people right now watching me are hurting or have some scars or some season you regret or some mistake you regret because we did not have the guardrails of the moral wisdom of God and the theological truth of God to keep us from having crashes in our life. How many of us right now have shed tears because we did not have guardrails, have lost relationships because we did not have guardrails, have ruined marriages because we did not have guardrails, have lost opportunities because we did not have guardrails? How many people you and I formerly knew who are no longer here died in their sin, crashed up their lives on the side of the road? Because they did not have safeguards in their life. They will watch driving down life with this false sense of security. Thinking, man, I could just keep going. I will never have a crash. And even if they drove their entire life, they drove all the way to the end of the road. They drove through every storm, every weather pattern, every challenge without God. And they drove all the way to the end of their life with the ignorance of God's word, the ignorance of the truth of God. Ultimately, a severe crash still awaits that person when they take their last breath and they wake up on the other side of eternity only to hear, depart from me. I never knew you. And so the word of God is a safeguard, a protection for our minds, 
and our hearts and our lives. It is a safeguard of protection from us crashing. For some of us, crashing, but maybe just enough to recover. And for some of us, crashing to we, we can never bounce back from some of those deep accidents. Like rails, it guards us morally and theologically from destroying ourselves and destroying the lives of others. And Paul would now give the Philippians and every person watching a very important safeguard to potentially protect your life from a watch devastating crash that what Paul would now do in the next few verses would write something to the Philippian church and to every Christian, every person listening, every man and woman watching right now, what Paul would do in the next few verses. I wish we would send this message to every unbeliever that we know. You heard me? Share this message with every unbeliever. That you know, because what Paul would do next will be, he will write to the Philippians a series of verses that is a safeguard from us having a tragic crash that which we can never rebound from if we travel down the road without these proper safeguards. He will say to them in verse 2 and 3, watch the guardrails he puts on their lives. Watch out for dogs, he says. Those men who do evil. Those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are of the circumcision. We who worship by the spirit of God. Who glory in Christ Jesus. And I would say in Christ alone. And watch these next words. We who understand who Jesus is. What he has done. The truth of the word of God. The dangers of driving to the end of life without the safeguards of the word of God. He said it is we, watch, 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 who put no confidence in the flesh. Watch. We put no confidence in the flesh. So he warns them to watch out for a triple threat. For dogs, for evil men, and for mutilators. Who is Paul talking about all three of these threats is talking about one group of people we need to go back into our jewish history to understand the impact of this verse that when the church of jesus christ was born in the first century a.d jesus came before preaching the gospel to jews first then the church of jesus christ is born the gospel message goes out to jews first and then it spreads to samaria where people who were half jews and have Gentiles, and then the gospel will now spread to Gentiles, non-Jewish believers. Peter, one of the followers of Jesus Christ, would convert the very first non-Jewish person to Christianity. Paul would then be called by God to go out into the world and take the gospel to the non-Jewish world. And now in church history, we have a monumental problem would break out in church. So big was the problem that the Bible tells us in Acts, they had to convene a council to deal with the issue. Here was the problem. These non-Jewish people that we're preaching the gospel to, nah, they can't just receive Jesus by faith with grace. No, they got to adopt all of the laws of the Jewish nations. They got to adopt all of the traditions of the Jewish nation. It's not enough for them to put their faith in Christ. No, it got to be Jesus plus the laws of the Jewish nations. It's not enough for them to put their faith in Christ through grace. No, it must be grace plus all the laws of the Jewish nations. Nah, salvation can't come that easy by Jesus alone. Salvation has to come from us practicing all of these laws and regulations and days and times. That is the only way we be saved, that we will be saved by the works of our flesh. This group of people were called Judaizers, and they were angry at the fact that the gospel was going out to non-Jews. They were angry at the fact that the message became so simple that God saves people by faith in Jesus alone. No, no, no. That's not enough. We got to do something to pervert that message, destroy that message, to stamp out that message. And so this group of Jews, they would follow Paul around the known world and any place he planted a church and leave 
They will show up behind him, right, flaunting their credentials. I'm a, I'm apostle so-and-so. Y'all know how this go down because we, we do this in America, right? I'm apostle so-and-so, and I'm prophet so-and-so, and I got 300,000 people following me on Instagram, so I need to be able to come to your church. How stupid. Like, like sending me DMs. I need to come preach in your church. Fool, I don't even know you. I don't even know you. Like, I need to come preach at victory. Fool, I don't even know you. Why? Because your name is Apostle so-and-so and you got a big following on social media? Like, how perverted is that? But here are the Judaizers. They roll up in the churches. They roll up in church and they say, now, that dude Paul, now he was preaching a gospel that was, watch, too easy to believe. But you can't just accept Jesus alone. Now, you got to add all these other things in order to be saved. You can't put confidence in the power of Jesus. You got to put confidence in your own flesh to save you on the day of judgment. And so they followed Paul's ministry, wreaking havoc in all of his churches, trying to overturn the ministry of Paul with, watch, false doctrines, perverted teachings lies of their human ingenuity their own misguided doctrines because jesus was not enough they aggressively preached false doctrines tearing up churches and wreaking havoc in paul's ministry trying to steal converts from troll churches paul called these dudes dogs they're not like the cuddly ones we have today like chance And Cece, pray for her. She needs deliverance. He called them dogs. In that culture, dogs were filthy creatures, nasty. He called them dogs. They were, watch, scavengers that would be on the side of the road, their body full of maggots. He called them evil. Why? Because they perverted a pure message that inherent in that message was a power in the simple message of the cross. He called them evil for perverting that message, for trying to lead people into hanging on to the traditions of men to be saved. He called them, watch, mutilators of the flesh. They don't circumcise. They watch. They castrate men and women, right? They destroy their faith. They shake them down from believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And many of us watching right now, we have been... (laughs) We have come up in churches with Judaizers who were pastors. We've gone to conferences with Judaizers who were pastors. Some of you watching me right now, you know what it is to live under the tyranny of some false doctrine. You know what this is. You know what kind of churches this was. Some of us came out of churches that were led by Judaizers, people that said Jesus Christ was not enough for salvation. It was always the blood plus. The blood plus works, the blood plus traditions, the blood plus baptism, the blood plus communion, the blood plus that if you don't do all these other things, you can't be saved. And so it was the blood plus you got to wear a dress down to your ankles. It was the blood plus a special wardrobe, a blood plus don't wear earrings and makeup. It was a blood plus you only could serve Jesus on a particular day of the week. That if you don't serve him on the Sabbath, you're going to hell. See, I'm leaning in on all of these spinoffs of Christianity that is the blood plus something. It's the cross of Christ plus something else for salvation. That Jesus is not enough. It's the blood plus the yoke of bondage of holding and clinging to all of the traditions because My grandfather taught me that, or my bishop taught me that. It's the blood plus a class for six months in order for me to be saved. It's the blood plus rituals, the blood plus traditions. It is a gospel plus message. It is a performance-based gospel. It is a earning something from God that can only be freely given. It is a religious form of Christianity that puts heavy ropes around the necks of men. It binds them under heavy burden and watch, it robs them of, watch this word, freedom. It robs them of freedom. And so many of you watching me right now, you know what it is to be doing church and feeling so depressed because of all of the extra things you think you have to do 
to earn God's love and acceptance and the gift that was given to us at the cross. This same group of Judaizers, they wasn't only tearing up the church at Philippi. Man, they were tearing up the church all around the Mediterranean rim. They were tearing up the church at Ephesus, the church of Ephesians. So in that letter, the letter to Ephesians, Paul wrote this to them in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, no confidence in your own flesh. It is a gift of God, not by work so that watch no man could boast. No man can say I'm saved because of my heritage. I'm saved because I was born in church. I'm saved because of my morality. Here's a good one. I'm saved because I am a good person. How many times have you heard that? I'm saved because I'm a good person. I'm on my way to heaven because I'm a good person. You are speeding for a crash at the bottom of a ditch, right? He says, man, it is a gift of God, not a gift of a class, not a gift of tradition, not a gift of you got to dress holy. What is dressing holy anyway? Not a gift of you can't wear earrings or don't put on makeup or you can't have a haircut or better not get a tattoo. Not a gift of traditions. It is a gift of God so that, watch, when it comes to the unbeliever, no one could boast that we can't say it was because I was moral, because I was good, because my father was a pastor, my grandmama was a prayer warrior. And I can't ride into heaven on somebody else's faith. It is a gift of God for you personally to take off the table our ability to boast. And when the same group of false teachers, they flooded the churches that Paul planted in an area called Galatia, they were tearing up the churches at Philippi, tearing up the churches in Ephesus, tearing up the church in Galatia. He would write to the people in Galatia and watch. Look at what he says to them. He says to them in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, verse 5, you foolish Galatians, you stupid people. Yeah, Paul talked like that. Huh? You foolish Galatians, you stupid people. Who has bewitched you? Man, some of y'all need to wake up because you listen to too many preachers on too many podcasts. You go to too many conferences. You read too many foolish books of people that are bewitching you. Your life is a wreck on the inside because of all of the wrong voices in your ears. He said, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has tricked you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the spirit of God by observing laws, the traditions of men, regulations, dressing holy, not getting a tattoo, don't put on your earrings, don't put on your lipstick, better not go to the movies? Did you get the spirit of God by doing all those works? Or was it by believing what you heard? the message of Jesus Christ. Are you so foolish? Are you so stupid that after beginning with the spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Are you trying to earn God's love by human effort? Are you trying to earn acceptance from God by human effort? Are you trying to get into heaven by human effort? Are you trying to be holy by human effort? Have you suffered so much for nothing? If it really was for nothing, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law? Let's watch. Does God move mightily in your life because some of merit of your own? This is so powerful. We see signs and wonders and miracles and all that, and we think God is moving because we're good. We think God is blessing because we're good. We think God is opening doors because we're good. We think our names is written in heaven because we are good. Because we are moral. He said, does God give the spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law, because you have all these rituals? Or was it because you believed what you heard? Watch. And after sending them a, just a short greeting, watch how he opens the letter to the church at Galatia. This, how do you start a letter like this? He just gets straight to the point. Like, no, no, no softening up the mid. Nah, he just dives straight in. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. I am astonished. That you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ 
And now you are turning to, everybody watch, a different gospel. Look right at me. They're turning to a different gospel. Let's keep reading. Which is really no gospel at all. What, what, what did they say? What did they read? What did you hear on that podcast? Jesus plus what? The cross plus what? The cross plus this. It is no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Verse 8, but even, oh my God, but even if we, Paul and my team, or an angel comes down from heaven and should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let that preacher be eternally condemned or let that preacher be damned. It's not that serious. He said, even if an angel comes down from heaven and preaches any other gospel than faith in Jesus Christ alone, let that preacher be condemned. He said, but now y'all wasn't listening, so let me repeat myself. Verse 9, as we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody... You fill in the blank. If anybody, your favorite preacher, your favorite author, your grandmama, apostle so-and-so, and bishop so-and-so, if anybody, anybody includes anybody, if anybody, anybody, if anybody, he says, preach to you a gospel other than the one you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Did you, did you see that? Let's say, if if anybody would pervert the gospel, let that preacher be damned. He said, listen, for the twisting of the gospel, you are worthy of hellfire for that. And how important is the purity of the message? How important is us serving, praying, laboring for the spread of that message? He said, if anybody perverts the gospel, let that person be condemned. Like, he doesn't even give any hope for the false preacher. Wherever there is preaching that attaches salvation to and subsequent calling to any form of personal merit, any form of work, any form of anything that I can do to say, man, I'm saved because I did this or God loves me because I did this. Any of those things, they lead to watch boasting in our works and boasting in ourselves. It creates a confidence in the flesh. And it's because of this confidence And a lot of people walking around who have a false sense of security that they are safe and they are coming for a rude awakening when they wake up on the other side of their last breath. They put confidence in the flesh. I know I'm going to heaven because I'm moral. I know I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person. I know, watch, the God I serve would never create a place that Jesus called hell. And because of this false confidence, people all around us, your family, your cousins, your mother, your father, your friends, people that follow you on social media, because of this false confidence all around our country, because America is a Christian nation. It's because of this false confidence that people put in their flesh that a lot of people don't even realize they're driving up mountains with no guardrails headed for a crash and a deep ditch. And man, that should awaken somebody, if not anybody, the church of Jesus. We who have the message, we who have the truth, man, we should be awakened to the fact to try to rescue as many people as possible and open as many eyes as possible, especially with those who are driving through life with a false sense of security. It is the boasting in something I earned the boasting in something I did or the boasting in my morality. In the gospel of grace, salvation is by faith in Christ alone. No boasting in some merit of my own. No boasting in my flesh. No boasting in anything else except the cross of Calvary. That me, Philip Anthony Mitchell, you fill in the blank. Man, we can't boast and not give or boast because I can preach or boast because Frank can play or boast because we can't make a boast in anything except the cross of Calvary. 
Man, if I've been blessed, if I've been saved, if I've been kept, if I've been taken care of, I can't put boast in my merit, my ingenuity, my creativity. No, man, when we are wise and grown in maturity, we put no boast in anything except the cross of Christ. We say, man, it is the goodness of God. I am what I am. It is the goodness of God. I have what I have. This is what separates Christianity from all the other religions of the world. That for Christianity, man, it is a salvation through faith and grace. And for all the other religions of the world, it is salvation to some false deity because of works. It is, watch, I got to keep working to earn my salvation with this false deity. Let me ask you a question. If you got to work to earn salvation, my question is, how will you know you've done enough? How would you know when you've done enough? Go check the Quran, check the Pearl of Great Price, check the Book of Mormon, check all these other things. I could just keep going down the list. You want to keep going down the list? If I got to work to earn uh, uh, acceptance from my deity, how would I know I've done enough? And this is what separates Christianity, the, the, orth, the orthodox doctrine of the Bible from every other belief system in the world. That we don't have to work for salvation. We don't have to work to earn God's love. We don't have to work for it. It is given to us freely because of the death and sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is as simple as me believing. You know what that gives the soul? Watch this word. What some of us need. Because you sleep and you don't get this. It's called rest. It's called rest for your weary soul. I met a shorty on IG live I was doing the other day with my cousin Maisha, and there was a female in there saying, man, I'm afraid. And she was saying, I'm afraid because I'm not sure if I'm saved. I'm not sure if I die. I'm going to go to heaven. You know what she did not have? Rest in her soul. And I said, sis, listen, I want you to DM my cousin Maisha, and we're going to have a private conversation with you. We'll do whatever we have to do on the backside to make sure that your name is truly sealed in the Lamb's book of life. And think about how many people all around us have a false sense of security because they're living out a performance-based religion. One is a message of receiving. The other is a message of earning. One gives the soul rest. The other makes the soul weary with burden. Why was this so important to Paul? Why is this still so important today? Listen to me. I know all, there's so many of you, we so hyper-political. We be saying, man, the church is under attack by the, the, the left side, the, by left wing this, and the church is under attack by this group, and this group is trying to change the Bible, and they're trying to pass these laws and all, all that. Look, 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 look. Jesus said the gates of hell would never prevail against the church. That is, any force coming from outside can't prevail against the church. Listen, the most dangerous threat to any believer and the church is not the threats that are coming from the outside. The most dangerous threat to any Christian or any believer, look right at me, is false teaching. Because false teaching leads to false believing and false believing leads to bad decisions and bad decisions will lead to crashes on the side of the road. Some people will never bounce back from false teaching. You know how many lives have been destroyed by false teaching? Do you know how many marriages have been destroyed by false teaching? Do you know how many people right now are separated from God for all eternity because they believe something that was not according to the truth of God's word? The, da- the most dangerous threat to your spiritual health and the health of the church is not some attack from the outside. It is false teeth. It is the cancer that's alive on the inside. The greatest threat to the American church is the American pulpit. Not something from the outside. The greatest threat to the American church is the American pulpit. Tweet that. Philip Anthony Mitchell. The greatest threat to the American church is the American pulpit. It's all of the garbage that's being preached right now on Sunday across the nation, leading people astray, giving them a false sense of security, preaching the doctrines of demons and devils, lies from the pit of hell, 
yo, messages coming from Google and not even coming from the word of God. It's people sitting in churches, millions of them right now, all across this country with this false sense of security. I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person and I've never heard the gospel preached in my church. I've never been confronted with the truth of the word of God. I've never heard that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. Now, I was raised in church. I am on my way. Man, sometimes it'd be the people right on the doorstep won't make it into heaven. The most dangerous, I was raised in church my whole life, and sometimes it'd be them same people that Jesus says, depart from me, you work of iniquity, I never knew you. Who was he talking to? He said, people that came to me and said, Lord, Lord. That's people who knew his name, people who thought that they were safe, people who thought that they were secure, people who put confidence in their flesh. So Paul said to them, and to you and I, watch out for these dogs. Verse 2. These evil men, these mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are of the circumcision, we who worship by the spirit of God, we who glory in Christ Jesus, who put no confidence in the flesh. Verse four through six, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. Now, this is powerful. If anyone else thinks that he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more than him. He's talking about these Judaizers. These Judaizers came talking about their Jewish resume and all this stuff. He said, y'all think these Jewish, these Judaizers, they have, they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh. You think these dudes are dope? Like they got clout because they're Jewish? No, 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 no. Let me show you what clout is. If anybody thinks they have reasons to have confidence in the flesh, he says, I have more. I got more clout than all of these Judaizers. And then he goes on the list of his resume. Watch. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. And so Paul says to them, them false teachers you listen to were Jews, they came to your church bragging about their Jewish ways. You trying to get them clout because they're Jews? Nah, I got more to brag on than them. If anybody got a reason to boast and have confidence in the flesh, it's me. I got a much deeper resume than all these dudes. So Pete Paul's resume, let me read it to you again. Circumcised on the eighth day. That means, watch, he was raised in a godly home with parents who make sure he was circumcised eight days after he was born. They made sure they taught him the laws from the time he was a baby. He said, of the people of Israel. That means, man, I'm not a half-blooded Jew. I'm a pure-blooded Jew. He said, of the tribe of Benjamin. You know your history? Twelve sons became twelve tribes of Israel. And two sons was born to a woman named Rachel who was barren. God opened up a room and she had two sons, two young sons. And one of them was named was Benjamin. And the father said, this is the son of my right hand. The right hand represented favor. This was one of the most coveted tribes in all of Israel. Like if you was from Benjamin, you were hot. If you was from Benjamin, you was popping like, yo, it was like from being a dope part of the city. You know what I'm saying? So he was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was from a coveted tribe. He was from a tribe that came the first king of Israel. He said a Hebrew of Hebrews. Why? Notice he said, watch, a Hebrew of Hebrews, because Paul ran in the upper echelons of society. He ran with the best of the best, the biggest names. He was the hottest rabbi in the streets underneath Gamaliel, the person that taught him everything that he knew. He ran with the top socioeconomic status of wealth and fame and those who were connected. He said, I am a Pharisee. I am a member of the highest ranking religious and political sect in all of the nation of Israel. I'm connected spiritually. I'm connected religiously. I'm connected politically. He said, as for zeal, persecuting the church. That is this new thing that was born in the first century called the church. It was a threat to Judaism. We need to stop it. And Paul took it upon himself to stop the church, persecute the church, Killing believers, men and women, he was responsible for the death of the very first Christian martyr in world history, a man named Stephen. He said, man, I persecuted the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. That is, you know that law? I kept that perfectly, and when I fell short, I had the perfect sacrifice. Man, you couldn't catch me blameless on nothing. And rehearsing all of that, his his perfect past, his, his wealth, his prestige, his elite Jewish life, his connections, all of that. Watch how he begins to close this section of the letter. He said, man, I had everything life could possibly offer. I had prestige. I had wealth. 
I was connected. I'm, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews from the tribe of Benjamin. Man, nobody can boast more than me. I had more than any other Jew in the nation of Israel running, preaching. But verse 7, well, whatever was to my prophet, I now consider those things loss for the sake of knowing Christ. Yeah, Paul had a lot to lose, his reputation, his circles, his wealth, his fame, his self-reliance, all of that stuff. When Paul weighed all that he had accumulated in life, juxtaposed salvation in Jesus Christ. He said, man, when I look at all those things that could not save me, I count them as loss for the sake of knowing Jesus, that all all that I had could not save me from the wrath that is to come. All that I had could not put me in right standing with God. And when I weigh them on the scale next to salvation with Jesus Christ, I count them as nothing, he said. And then his gains, verse eight. But what is more? I consider everything in loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ. Paul lost his religion, but he gained his salvation. He lost his reputation, but he gained Jesus Christ. He said to himself, the fact that I am saved I have knowledge of Christ. I have an intimate relationship with Christ. I can hear from Christ. I'm comforted by Christ. I'm protected from Christ. I'm being led by Christ. I've been walking with Christ. I will see Christ. I will be rewarded from Christ. I will escape wrath because of Christ, man. There is nothing else I have in this life that could compare to what I have in Jesus Christ. Now, this is not descriptive or this is not prescriptive, it is descriptive. This is Paul saying, this is not saying you got to get rid of everything tomorrow, family. This is not saying tomorrow morning or Monday, sell your house, your car, and go be homeless in the street. This is not what he's saying. What he's saying is when you stack up everything you possess, both tangible and intangible, in comparison to Jesus Christ, these things can't save, these things can't truly satisfy the soul. And when I think about everything I have that cannot save me on the day of judgment, They do not compare to having Christ. Jim Elliott said this, he is no fool to give what he cannot keep, to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool to give what he cannot keep, to gain what he cannot lose. Uh, You know, that's like I was at a funeral a couple days ago And I've been to a lot of funerals and I've seen a lot of services and a lot of different arrangements and and all this stuff. You know, there is one thing I've never seen at a funeral, all the funerals I've been to. I've I've never seen a U-Haul hooked up to the back of a hearse. And I've never seen a trailer hooked up to the back of a hearse. That is, every time I've been to the funeral, I'm always reminded that we can't carry anything out of this life. And there is nothing you have and I have that's tangible, intangible, that's going to prepare me for what I have to deal with on the other side of my last breath, except I had the guardrails of salvation in Jesus Christ. He finishes the letter or this section of the letter with these words. He says, and being found in him, not having a righteousness of my own. Everybody, listen, that comes from the law but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Watch. So Paul drives home what he's trying to say with this final thought. Everybody watch. That I was found in Christ not having a righteousness of my own. That is, there was nothing I had, nothing I can do, nothing I possess that can give me, watch this, right standing with God. Now, a lot of us, we hear sermons like this and, you know, we, we get bored. We don't care. We, but do you know everybody's headed for the same fate? We all are going to die and we're all going to stand before God. Every single person watching me, every person you know. Your, and, and listen, he said there is, there is nothing we have that can say we have righteousness on our own. That is, listen to me, there is nothing any human being can do, possess, buy, save, wear, or hold to. 
that will put them in right standing with God. There is nothing you can do to be in right. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me say this again. There is nothing you and I can do in this life, in our own flesh, to put ourselves in right standing with God. The Bible says the wrath of God is being revealed against all sin and ungodliness. That wrath is going to be fully executed in the judgment. And there is nothing you and I can do in this life to protect ourselves from that wrath in our own flesh. We have no righteousness of our own. In fact, Isaiah said all of our righteousness are like filthy rags, i.e. they are like a tampon is what the Bible teaches. He said, but I was found in Christ to have a righteousness that came from God. That is, watch, that because of the sacrifice of Jesus, that on the cross, he did this word, imputed his perfect righteousness for my unrighteousness. And there was an exchange at the cross. And for every one of us who believe, I obtained the perfect righteousness of Christ. And that every time the Lord sees me, he sees me covered in the blood of Jesus. And it is that righteousness and that righteousness only plus nothing else. No confidence in my behavior or my flesh is not being me being good or doing anything else is the only thing that will be the guardrails, the safeguard for my life when I stand to meet the Lord. Let's go a little bit deeper. There's some of you right now, man, you always, always hurting, wondering, does God love me? I messed up. I fell short. I'm in some dry place. I don't read my Bible enough. My prayer life is not good. And you always condemn yourself and you beat yourself down because you do that partly because of the way you see God and the way you see righteousness. Oh God, you, you think if you don't read enough and if you don't pray enough and if your church attendance ain't dope and all this other stuff, you think God is mad at you. Why? Because you still see your relationship with God as being connected to your own merit. This is because we have a wrong view of righteousness. And when we start to learn that, listen, God's love for you is not going to change because of some mistake you made or something wrong you did. Because when he sees you, look right at me. In all of your mistakes and all of your failures, and all of your insecurities and all of your hangups and in all of your shortcomings. And every time you look in the mirror and you condemn your own self for who you are or what you did or what you did not do, you made one good decision some time ago. You put your faith in Jesus. And that what you don't realize theologically is that every time God looks at you, He sees the blood. And because of that, there is this powerful theological word that says you have been justified. That God sees you just as if you had never sinned. That as long as you are in Christ, rejoice in Christ. Every time he looks at you, he just sees someone who has been watched justified. As if you've never sinned. And we keep persecuting ourselves because we think that he's mad at us because of some mistake or some failure or some shortcoming and we shed tears that we could have wiped out of our eyes yesterday or some season ago because we keep thinking that his love for me his love for you is contingent upon your behavior if salvation was contingent upon your behavior it would be weak Salvation is contingent upon something much stronger than your behavior, much stronger than your mistake, much stronger than your insecurities. The cross of Calvary, the blood of Jesus, says you've been justified. So, Pastor, I don't, I don't really understand that. You know, it's like, it's like President Trump last week did something that had people upset. <laughs> He had a a homeboy, a crony, who was the first director of national security in the Trump administration. And that man was convicted 
of lying to the grand jury not once but twice under oath and was watched guilty of lying. And because he was guilty of lying, he was sentenced to go to prison. But then President Trump came in and said, what? I know he's guilty. He lied twice. But I'm going to do something that I have the power to do. And Trump pardoned Michael Flynn. He gave him a full presidential pardon. And because of that pardon, Flynn has been exonerated from going to prison. But it does not erase the fact that he lied under oath twice. So although he is guilty, he will not see one day in prison because he was pardoned. And in the same way, everybody watching me right now is guilty. We were all guilty. We broken God's laws. We done wrong. We were born in sin. But you know what you and I received who are in Christ? We received a kingdom pardon. Where Jesus came into the courtroom and said to the father, I know Philip is guilty, but I pardon him from his sins because he put his faith in me. I know sister is guilty, but I pardon her because she put her faith in me. I know that brother's guilty, but I pardon him because he put his faith in me. We've received kingdom pardons. Those of us who have put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because there is a joy to be found in just believing and not working. And so I want to say to somebody watching right now, don't, don't turn off the chat. And for all the Christians in the room, you don't get up and walk out the room. Listen, I feel like in this moment, we need to rescue from somebody from, from driving off that mountain into a ditch. Maybe there's somebody watching this message right now. Maybe somebody sent you this message. Maybe you've been exploring the claims of Christ. Maybe you've been in church your whole life, but you're not even sure if you're really saved. You've put confidence in your flesh, confidence in your traditions, confidence in your morality, confidence in the fact that you are a good person. But the truth of the matter is that confidence is a false security. And if you die with that confidence in the flesh, you will be separated from God for all eternity. So here is the gospel. You and I are sinners and we have broken God's laws. And the scripture says the penalty for sin is eternal separation from God Almighty. And why Jesus taught us about a real place named hell where people are suffering for all eternity and they will never get out. But God in his love for you and I, not wanting you to perish, my brother, my sister, he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the earth. He lived a sinless life. He died a sacrificial death in your place. And then the father says, if anyone would just put their faith in Jesus, not in works, not in flesh, not in a class, if you just put your faith in him, just believe that he's the son of God. Believe he has been raised from the dead and you put your trust in him and return from your sin. The scripture says you will be, watch this, saved, E.D., rescued from the wrath to come and put on a path to live the abundant life that Jesus promised you, a life of purpose until you see his face. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm talking to you, my sister. You hear my voice? I'm talking to you, my brother. You hear my voice and believers are praying in the chat and not logging off. This is your moment. Maybe this whole message was for you. This whole gathering was for you. This moment is for you. Now you have the opportunity to make the most important decision you will ever make in your life. The gospel comes to you and the Bible says in the day you hear it, harden not your heart and I'm not only talking to the unbeliever I'm talking to some man some woman you've been in church your whole life and you think you're saved you've just been religious but you've been confident in your flesh now is your moment to be truly watched born again for you to become a son and daughter of the most high God for your name to be written in the Lamb's book of life for you to pillow your head tonight with rest, knowing that if you die tomorrow, you will not endure one day in hell. You would wake up in the presence of your Savior. Is that you? 
And I want to invite you to pray. According to Romans chapter 10, that Jesus who is alive and not dead, he can hear you right now. And all you got to do is whisper to him right where you are with tears in your eyes, with confusion in your mind, and your stomach in knots. Yes, that's the feeling of you about to cross over from death to life. Right there, you, right now. Right now, you. Don't wait. Don't wait for tomorrow. Tomorrow's not promised to you. Kobe had plans for 2021, and he will not see them. Tomorrow is not promised to you today. Right now, today is the day of salvation. You, I'm talking to you. A magic prayer won't save you, but you calling on Jesus with sincerity of heart will save you. Just whisper to him. He can hear you right now. Just say his name. Say, Lord. Come on, talk. He can hear you. I know you. I know you're crying. I know you're grieving. I know you're confused. Just talk to him. He's not dead. Say, Lord, forgive me for all of my sin, for all of my wrongdoing. I'm sorry. I believe that you are the Son of God the risen Savior and right now I put my faith in you and you alone I receive you as my Lord and my Savior you are my safeguard I put no confidence in my flesh and now father in the name of Jesus I pray for every man and woman that prayed that prayer for the very first time with sincerity of heart you know them God the words that I utter can save them but only the movement of the Holy Spirit can unzip every brother and sister watching and take from them their unrighteousness and zip them up with the Spirit of God and the righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ. And so, Father, I pray for everyone that prayed that prayer that you are saving right now, you are converting right now, they're being born again right now, this very moment, they are passing from death to life, from darkness to the light. I pray, God, according to Ephesians, that the Spirit of wisdom and the Spirit of knowledge and the revelation of Jesus would rest upon them mightily that they would know what is the great hope and the calling you have called them, that they would know what is the depth of your love that has saved them. I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, you would draw them to yourself and that you would put them on a path with guardrails to the left and the right, the wisdom of your word and the truth of your word. And they will live out the rest of their days in purpose, pursuing the call that you have placed on their life, serving you, loving you, walking with you, knowing you intimately until they die and burst the tape of eternity and stumble into the loving arms of their Savior. I pray that you would lead them into gospel community if they don't belong to victory. And that you would drive away every lie of the devil. That you would help them to know according to the book of Corinthians that they are a new creature in Christ Jesus. They have been forgiven of all of their sin. They have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. They have been made white as snow. They can turn off this podcast, turn off this broadcast, turn off this message in peace, knowing that their names have been sealed in the Lamb's Book of Life. I thank you, God, for all of these gems. And I cry out with the young Moravian. May the Lamb who was slain receive the rewards of his suffering souls father I pray that over them and for every man and woman who belong to you watching that we would pray for the loss pray for those around us who are separated from you pray for those who are in danger of crashing pray for those who have put confidence in the flesh and are living under false security that we would be aggressive in these last days of the church age and working together for the spread of the gospel, the message of hope, 
found in Jesus Christ alone. That is my prayer for my brothers and sisters, that we would pray radically, give generously, serve selfishly for the spread of the gospel in these last days. That is my prayer for my brothers and sisters in the mighty and majestic and matchless name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen and amen. I love you, family. Let's fight for what's going to matter a hundred years from now and push out every Judaizer and stand and contend for the spread of the gospel. It's the only thing that's going to matter a hundred years from now. I'll see you next week, God willing. Go in peace. Take territory and spread the gospel. In Jesus' name. Thank you for listening to the Victory Broadcast. We pray that message was a blessing to you. If you have a story or a testimony to share, we want to hear all about it. Send us an email to share at victorychurchatl.org or visit us online under share. Thanks for listening. Go in peace.